Hi, here we are again, and it's um, we're uh, into our third week of the class. How's everybody doing? Um, and now we're ready for the book of Proverbs. So, uh, you know, after after this uh, lesson and the Q and A, then there will just be one more week before the test. So I hope everybody's doing good, and I hope you're learning. Uh, a lot of things, and I hope this has been productive for you. So uh, let's get into the book of Proverbs, and we'll just have a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and that you are so wise and that you've passed on uh, wisdom to us through the book of Proverbs and many all throughout the Bible. But we see here so many wise sayings, and Lord, may we take to heart the wisdom uh, the treasure of wisdom that's contained in this book. I ask for your anointing, your instruction, your teaching. Teach us, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit and reveal to us what you are saying to us and help us to apply it to our lives and to those we teach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, we want to begin with, we're just going to begin with some introduction um, overview, you know, history and background on the book of Proverbs, and then we'll get into some other things. But uh, the Hebrew name is Mishli, and we would write that out in English as M-I-S-H-L-E-Y, M-I-S-H-L-E-Y. Of course, the actual Hebrew word itself is written much differently, you know, those Hebrew letters um, that look um, so different. But anyway, uh, its author is primarily Solomon. Uh, Solomon is primarily the author of, of Proverbs. And he began the Proverbs approximately 1000 BC. Um, and of course, its theme is on wisdom. And the, the, um, the verse, uh, the verse in Proverbs that gives us the theme of Proverbs is found in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And let's just read it there together, Proverbs 1, 7. To know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's found in verse 7 of chapter 1. Um... Also in this book, as in the other uh, poetic books, is the use of, you know, uh, the, this poetic structure that was, that was very popular at that time. The use of an, antithetical comparisons, as we talked about last week, which is uh, contrasting. A contrast, one line will say, state one thing and then the next line states the contrast. That's antithetical comparisons, the use of, uh, you know, the synonymous um, comparisons, which means it states the same thing in just another other words in the next line, and then the use of synthetic or amplified um, comparisons, uh, and it just expounds or amplifies it, you know, and this is used all, these three are used all through the book of Proverbs. Um, so the ultimate message of the book is the theme that we just read from verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And of course, Proverbs, the first verse of Proverbs tells us that these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And this is a title. This is like a title for the book of Proverbs because basically he wrote m most of the Proverbs, most of the book, but uh, there were some that were written by uh, others. Um, but technically a proverb is a profound maxim or an epigram uh, grammatic statement that if pondered on for a length of time, there is a deeper meaning associated with it. You know, you, you don't just look at Proverbs and skim through it and 
oh yeah, I've read my, you know, I've read the book of Proverbs, you know, and it just seems to be a lot of unrelated things that are repeated over and over. But it has a much deeper meaning and it has so much, not just information, but wisdom to live by and to apply to our lives uh, that is tried and true. Uh, Proverbs was not uncommon in the ancient world. There were many Proverbs. You can read, you know, wise Proverbs of Confucius, for instance, and many others. So Proverbs weren't uncommon in the ancient world. But the concept of fearing a single God who is the only God and the giver of life was completely foreign in a world filled with polytheism. Multiple gods, where they believed in multiple gods, polytheism. And here was monotheism. One God, one Lord, one creator of all, one giver of life, and he's the only true God and Lord of all. So that was very, very uncommon in the ancient world to believe that and these Proverbs were based on that belief and that truth. And of course, we know Solomon is the son of David, uh, King David, and uh, Solomon was chosen to build the temple. Uh, the Lord didn't allow David to build the temple uh, because he, the Lord told him, he said, you've had to shed too much blood. David was a warrior king. He had to subdue the Philistines and uh, many other of the enemies of Israel to uh, bring the nation to where it should be and take the land that they were supposed to have. And so he was a warrior king and he went and, you know, in, led in many battles. And, and of course, there was great bloodshed. And so the Lord told him, he says, no. He said, you can get everything ready. You can gather it. I'll give you the plans and dimensions, but you can't build it. And so uh, Solomon was the one chosen to build the temple after David's death. And his name comes from the Hebrew, the root of the Hebrew word shalom, which is the word for peace. And he is recognized in the Bible as the ultimate peacekeeper king in Israel's history. Uh, they had a longer period of peace under Solomon uh, than anyone else. And so um, it's just unfortunate that Solomon didn't continue walking with the Lord and that his latter days were so different than his former ones because he had been blessed by God with wisdom. You know, we know the story of how Solomon, when, after he became king, uh, he went, you know, before the Lord and uh, was praying and seeking the Lord. And the Lord said, okay, ask me what you will and it's yours. And because Solomon didn't ask for wealth or long life or um, vengeance upon his enemies or anything like that, he asked the Lord for wisdom. The Lord said, oh, my this is this is wonderful. I'm so pleased. I, I'm so pleased that you've asked for wisdom. And because you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you all these other things. I'm going to give you long life. I'm going to give you um, rest from your enemies. And I'm going to give you great riches. And that's exactly what happened. And during Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel came to heights that it's never been to before. Yeah, he was, uh, at that time, when he asked for wisdom, he was a man of great humility. He was a great diplomat, and people came from all over the then-known world to hear his wisdom and to learn from him. Uh, the book of Kings indicates that Solomon wrote over 3,000 Proverbs, but only the ones we have in, uh-oh, uh I almost forgot to do that. Oh, this has been my <laughs> my one really um, mess up is keeping this thing 
activated here, the camera. Okay. <laughs> so you guys always have to bear with me on that. Um, but anyway, Solomon wrote over 3,000 Proverbs, but uh, only, it's a little less than 600 are recorded in the book of Proverbs. Um, so the first, like if, if, you know, really an outline of the book of Proverbs would be uh, the first nine chapters, chapters one through nine, where Solomon addresses the young and his words are arranged in a series of discourses in praise of wisdom. Uh, and you have a personification of wisdom as an instructor uh, warning against all manner of folly in those first nine verses. Uh, you know, in literature, when there's a personification, it means you take a... Um, you take a concept and you cause that concept to take on the uh, like personal um, human-like attributes and you give that concept, uh, you make them like a person who's speaking. That's personification in literature. And that's what uh, wisdom is in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. Uh, wisdom is personified and called she. Um, she's a female. Wisdom is uh, likened unto a female, and she's calling out to every person. She's calling out on the, in the street and in the center of town and on the high hill, calling out, please come and listen to me. Come and listen to my wisdom, and I'll teach you. I'll teach you the ways of wisdom, uh, which the beginning of it is the fear of the Lord, and to walk in the right path not follow evil uh, men and women, and uh, to be instructed. Uh, I want to instruct you in the ways of wisdom, which is the ways of life and righteousness and health and prosperity and peace and long life. You know, and she's calling and she's teaching and she's an instructor. So that's the first, in the first nine chapters, she's, uh, wisdom is personified as a female instructor. And then uh, the next section is Proverbs, the Proverbs uh, chapters 10 through 22, verse 16. Uh, from 10 to 22, 16 are the Proverbs of Solomon. And this section is usually thought to be the original nucleus around which the remainder of the book was constructed. Because if he wrote 3,000 Proverbs, and they took, you know, a little less than 600. They took them out, you know, the most, because, uh, I, you know, Proverbs repeats itself on these same themes over and over. So they took out um, this uh, almost 600, and they arranged them in this way. And so the next, uh, so this uh, second part, uh, chapters 10 through 22, verse 16, they think are the, first original nucleus around which the book of Proverbs was constructed. Then Proverbs 22, verse 17, through uh, chapter 24, verse 22, contains advice for those in responsible positions, you know, like leaders. And it's called the words of the wise. So that's just a short little segment there from chapter 22, verse 17 to 24, verse 22. And then the next section, if you're outlining the book, would be Proverbs chapter 24, verse 23 through verse 29. Just a very short section. These are designated as the Proverbs of Solomon, which the wise men of Hezekiah copied out. So um, these are, they were copied during the time of Hezekiah, and um, they are related on subjects such as, you know, rulers, sluggards, and fools. Wise men are not fools. Wise men are not sluggards. So that theme is repeated there in chapter 24. And then the final section of the book is Proverbs 30 and 31. Um, Proverbs 30 was written by a guy named Agar, Agar. and um, Proverbs 31, the great um, 
you know, godly woman chapter um, on womanhood is comes. It says it comes from the mother of King Lemuel. Uh, and many Bible scholars believe that King Lemuel was the nickname for Solomon when he was young. This was Bathsheba's nickname for Solomon as a young child. And that these were the wise sayings and proverbs that she passed on to him and, and for his future wife. But, of course, he had many wives. But anyway, Proverbs 31 was written in the acrostic form, like we talked about earlier uh, regarding some of the Psalms. It was written in the acrostic form, and the verses beginning with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet there in Proverbs 31. So that's just a little bit of an overview there, and then we're gonna I'm gonna get it get into more uh, here on Proverbs, and we'll look at some themes there. Um, one of the things that we see is the word proverb means to be like, to be like. Uh, so Proverbs is a book of comparisons between common, concrete images and life's most profound truth. It is a book of comparisons between common, concrete images and life's most profound truths. Proverbs are simple, moral statements or illustrations that highlight and teach fundamental realities about life. You know, like down where we live, the nitty-gritty. Uh, and we know, we've already stated how God, Solomon sought God's wisdom, and uh, the Lord answered his prayer. And these uh, proverbs are designed to make men contemplate, to think about and contemplate, uh, number one, the fear of God, and number two, living by God's wisdom. So they're, they're made, these proverbs are made to, for men to contemplate, number one, the fear of God, and number two, the, um, you know, living by God's wisdom. And one thing that we note is that the sum of this wisdom, the sum of all this wisdom, is personified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is found in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. I'll repeat that. The sum of all this wisdom that's contained here in the Proverbs is personified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is stated there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And, and we saw, you know, that wisdom in action through the Lord Jesus. Um, so, um, uh, let's see. The, one of the things that we also want to note is that um, it Proverbs reveals a godly perspective and is addressed to the naive and young who need to learn the fear of God. Okay, so it's from a godly perspective, and it's addressed to the naive and young who need to learn the fear of God. Uh, the, this book of Proverbs reflects, oh, I better move my little cursor, <laughs> I heard it's going to be going out. Uh, this book reflects a threefold setting, okay, number one, general wisdom literature, two, insights from the royal court, and three, instruction offered in the tender relationship of a father and mother with their children. Okay, so let me repeat that. This book reflects a threefold setting. Number one, general wisdom literature. Number two, insights from the royal court. And three, instruction offered in the tender relationship of a father and mother with their children. The, and these are all designed to produce meditation on God. All of these are designed to produce meditation on God, to think on these things, to meditate on them. Uh, and since Proverbs is wisdom literature, 
uh, by nature, it is sometimes difficult to understand. You know, a lot of people don't want to take the time to try to understand it. They don't want to take the time to think about it or contemplate on it, but then they're missing so much. Wisdom literature is part of the whole of Old Testament truth because the priest, you see, gave the law. The prophet gave a word from the Lord, and the sage or the wise man gave his wise counsel. And we see that, you know, throughout the Old Testament. The priest gave the law, the prophet gave a word from the Lord, and the sage or the wise man gave his counsel. And all work together for the glory of God, and all of that was from the Lord. The true um, truth and law is from God. True, A true word, uh, prophetic word is from the Lord, and true and wise counsel is from the Lord. So, um, although um, it is practical, the book of Proverbs is very, very practical. Although it is practical, Proverbs is not superficial or external because it contains moral and ethical elements stressing upright living which flow out of a right relationship with God. This is so very important. It's, under, uh, it's important for those you minister to to understand, and I'm going to repeat it. Although it is practical, Proverbs is not superficial or external be, because it contains moral and ethical elements stressing upright living which flow out of a right relationship with God. And that's very evident all throughout the book of Proverbs. Uh, in, in Proverbs 4, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Solomon connected three generations as he entrusted to his son Rehoboam what he learned at the feet of David and Bathsheba. So we see there the very first four verses of chapter 4 is Solomon connecting and passing on the wisdom that he had learned from his father and mother to his son, Rehoboam. Uh, and, I mean, it's so sad, you know, what happened to Solomon and Rehoboam. But it can happen to anyone. It's not how we start out, it's how we finish. And I think that's one of the great themes of uh, Solomon's life. It's not how we start out, but how we finish. So Solomon came to the throne with great promise, great privilege, and great opportunity. Oh, my. And God granted his request for the wisdom that he asked for, and his wisdom exceeded all others. Um, but the shocking reality is that he failed to live out the truth that he knew and that he even taught his son and others. And that right there is one of the main things I want to stress to us as pastors and ministers and leaders. It is so easy to preach and teach to others and not do it. It is one of the easiest things in the world. Uh, because, for instance, you're teaching something from the Word of God. You may be teaching something from Proverbs, and it's so good, and it's so true, and you know it's true. You agree with it completely. You see how important it is, you know it's valid, and you want to teach those under you, you want to teach your own children, you want to pass this truth on, you want their lives to be enriched by it, and so you're teaching, you're training, you're preaching it, and you're, you know, and you're agreeing with it completely, but as ministers and leaders, we still have to do it, just like everybody else. We still have to perform it. We still have to activate that word ourselves and walk in its truth, submit to it, and incorporate it into our lives, apply it to our lives. What is that word saying to us, and how does that affect us? How does that affect our thinking? How does that affect our actions? How does that affect our decisions? Are we taking that to heart? Over and over and over again, we can teach and preach and not do if we uh, aren't careful. We can find ourselves preaching and teaching something that we are not doing. 
and uh, Matthew 7, chapter 7, the end of the chapter, brings this point out so clearly. When, it, when Jesus is teaching and he gives the illustration of those who uh, come before him uh, and, they, and they say, Lord, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name. We've you know, healed the sick. We've done all these things in your name. And the Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew you. So these were people who preached and taught the word and saw results from it. They actually saw results from it. Lots of good results. Because the word will not return void. It will not. And any believing heart that hears the word and has faith to respond, they're going to get their answer. They're going to get their miracle. They're going to get their deliverance. Okay, that word will not return void. And then Jesus went on to tell the parable of the, the foolish man and the wise man. And what was the only difference between the wise man and the foolish man? They both had the same storms. Uh, they both had the same challenges. They both had the same horrible things that happened, you know, against their house or their life. And it says that one was founded on the sand and couldn't stand. Another was founded on the rock. But, but how did the Lord identify that there in, in chapter 7 of Matthew as far as it being on the sand or on the rock? The one heard the word and did it. The other heard the word and did not do it. That was the only difference. And that's what caused the one who heard it and did it caused the, word, the Bible to say that his house was built upon the rock. It's not just knowing Jesus. That isn't what it's talking about being built on the rock. It's not just knowing Jesus. It's applying his sayings and his commandments to our lives and actually walking them out, actually doing them, actually incorporating them into our lives. That's what makes the difference. There are so many people, Christians, people in churches who sit Sunday after Sunday, people even who preach and teach the word Sunday after Sunday, hear that word, preach that word. And then don't really do it or don't really incorporate it into their life. And they're, they can't stand. It, it all comes crashing down. And it, that's why we must take heed to ourselves. Not to be caught in those kind of traps and miss out. Miss out completely on the very thing that we've been teaching others. It's so important that we are a doer of the word, not just a hearer, not just a speaker of it, but a doer of it. And so we see that Solomon failed in this very foundational elementary uh, precept. He, he got all this wisdom from God. I mean, just think about it. I mean, when you read the book of Proverbs and when you read during his reign, all those wonderful wise things that he did, how wisely he uh, judged, you know, as a king and discerned and, and the things, the uh, construction going on in Israel, the, the wonderful architecture and the things, the ideas he had to build with and the creativity he had, the, all this that God gave him. And, and then ultimately, he failed to live out the truth that he knew and taught. And that's what brought him down. And it will bring any of us down. And so that is a very, very real issue and one that we must guard against at all costs. And I pray that none of us and none of you listening to this ever, ever fall into that trap. And if you find yourself falling into it, immediately repent and say, Lord, uh, help me here. Show me what I need to do. Show me uh, the next step. Show me how I can go from here and please you and walk in obedience to you and how I can apply these things to my life that I'm teaching. Okay, so Proverbs also contains a gold mine of biblical theology. Uh, and it, it reflects... Uh, themes of scripture, you know, themes that are th uh, throughout uh, scripture. 
uh, to the level of practical righteousness. Practical right, it, it addresses those issues of practical righteousness and man's ethical choices. It talks a lot about man's ethical choices. And it, uh, Proverbs calls into question how man thinks, not just what we say, but how we think. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Um, how a man thinks, how he lives, how he manages his daily life in the light of divine truth. All this is scrutinized in Proverbs. Uh, more specifically, Proverbs calls man to live as the Creator intended him to live when God made man. So I want to repeat that. Proverbs calls man to live as God intended, as the Creator intended him to live when God made man. That was God. This is God's intention, how we're to live and to walk in these wise ways and really uh, perform it. The reoccurring promise of Proverbs is that generally the wise, which is the righteous who obey God, live longer, prosper, experience joy, and the goodness of God temporally here in this life, while fools suffer shame and death. Okay, let me repeat that. The recurring promise of Proverbs is that generally the wise, which is the righteous who obey God, uh, live longer, they prosper, uh, they experience joy, and the goodness of God in this temporal life. While fools suffer shame and death, and a lot of other things, uh, but on the other side, you know, on the other hand, I would say, it, we also must remember that, generally speaking, there are some wicked people who prosper. You know, and that was one of the questions in, uh, that David brought to the Lord in the Psalms. Why do the wicked prosper? And, uh, and the Lord, you know, uh, answered him in his heart. But they, they don't, their, their prosperity doesn't last very long. It's, uh, it's a grief to them in the end. And they're like the grass that withers and is burned up and gone here today. And gone. They have no, they don't have, they will not uh, um, enjoy eternal life, you know, that kind of thing. So even though there are some ungodly people that prosper, it's not like, it looks, and of course we know that, but uh, anyone who walks in righteousness, walks with the Lord with a sincere heart and obeys him, walks in his ways and does what they know, they, they do what they know to do uh, from the Lord and from his word, there's protection and long life and uh, peace, prosperity, you know, uh, and we see that all around us. So there are a number of uh, important themes addressed in Proverbs, and I just want to give you a, a generally uh, three general um, broad categories of these themes. One, man's relationship to God. Man's relationship to God, number one. Man's relationship to himself. You know, how should I think? How should I live? And man's relationship to others. So we see that. Man's relationship to God, man's relationship to himself, and man's relationship to others. Um, the two major themes which are interwoven in a general sense and overlapping throughout Proverbs are wisdom and folly. And folly is also personified at times. So we see wisdom and folly contrasted with each other throughout the book of Proverbs. Wisdom, which includes knowledge, understanding, instruction, discretion, 
and obedience, and I'm going to repeat these, wisdom includes knowledge, understanding, instruction, direction, uh, discretion, I mean, discretion, and obedience is built on the fear of the Lord and the word of God. All of that is built on the fear of the Lord and the word of God. Folly is everything that's opposed to wisdom. Anything that is opposed to wisdom, anything that is the opposite of wisdom, anything that's the opposite of not true, uh, you know, real godly knowledge, real godly understanding and instruction and discretion and obedience to that. Anything opposite of that is folly. Okay. Uh, some of the, let's look at some of the interpretive challenges of Proverbs. As, you know, as a minister and a teacher, as a leader, uh, the first challenge is generally, is the generally elusive nature of wisdom literature. You know, like we said before, it's not, it's, it, to understand it, it's just not right there on the surface, usually. You need to think on it and contemplate it. Um, like the parables that Jesus taught, the intended truths are often veiled from understanding if given just a cursory glance. And uh, because these must be pondered in the heart. These proverbs that are written here, these wise sayings, they must be pondered in the heart. Another challenge of interpreting um, Proverbs is the extensive use of parallelism. And, of course, we've talked about that earlier, about parallelism and the different types of parallelism, and it's used all throughout Proverbs. Um, so, and sometimes the actual parallel is uh, only implied. It's not clearly stated. It's only implied. Um, so in interpreting the Proverbs, interpreting Proverbs, excuse me, one must determine the parallelism and often complete what is assumed and not stated by the author. I'm going to repeat that. In, in interpreting Proverbs, one must determine the parallelism, determine which kind of parallelism, and often complete what is assumed and not stated by the author. And that's so true. Two, identify the figures of speech and rephrase the thought without those figures. Okay, just pull out the actual uh, lesson, the actual instruction without the symbolism. Three, summarize the lesson or principle of the proverb in a few words. To summarize it in a few words. That helps to interpret. Uh, four, describe the behavior that is taught. Describe the behavior that's being taught there. And five, find examples inside scripture. Find other examples of this same truth. So that that's a those are uh, helpful tools in interpreting Proverbs and um, preparing messages or uh, sermons from, from Proverbs. Uh, challenges are also found in the various contexts of Proverbs. <laughs> you know, there's all these different contexts, you know, which also affect interpretation and understanding. First, there is the setting in which they are spoken. Was this proverb spoken in the king's court to leaders and to princes? Okay. Uh, was it spoken as a father and mother to their young child? You know, so there, first find out the setting in which these are spoken. And it, uh, this, you know, finding out the setting, this is largely the context uh, that is intended. Okay. Second, there is the setting of the book as a whole and how it is teaching its teachings are to be understood in the light of the rest of scripture. So see we have that also to take into consideration that the setting of the book as a whole and how its teachings are to be understood in the light of the rest of scripture. Um, and um, third, 
there is the historical context in which the principles and truths draw on illustrations from their own day and time. Sometimes just knowing the background of the uh, culture at that time in its context throws great light on um, more of what's being said there. And of course that can be applied to any part of scripture uh, from antiquity. But those are some uh, just good and wise general um, things to consider when interpreting the book of Proverbs. But a final challenge, a final area of challenge comes in understanding that Proverbs are divine guidelines and wise observations. They are divine guidelines and wise ob observations. It's not just the historical context. It's not just the cultural context. It's not just the setting. But what was the Holy Spirit saying here? Uh, you know, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel. What was he saying here through Solomon to all of us? Um, so there are underlying principles uh, and guidelines, wise observations, teach, the teaching of these underlying principles. Um, and it's not always just, you know, what we're seeing here in Proverbs is not just inflexible laws are absolute promises. It's practical, everyday wisdom and counsel to live by. And so these expressions of general truth, and you know, that's what we're talking about, these expressions of general truth um, have, do have exceptions uh, due to the uncertainty of life and unpredictable behavior of fallen men. So there are exceptions because of the unpredictability of life and of fallen men. And we, you know, we take all this into consideration. So um, God does not guarantee uniform outcome, except that his promises are true. I, you know, one of the things that I know is that if a person truly obeys the Lord from their heart, God's promise, and he's no respecter of persons. It's just that sometimes we look at someone and we say, oh, well, they're doing everything right, and it didn't work for them. But we don't know their heart. We don't know that person's heart. Look at Judas. I mean, the disciples, the, the night of uh, the Lord's betrayal when they were there in the upper room at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, uh, one of you is going to betray me tonight, and they all looked around at each other, except Judas, of course. They all looked around and said, oh, Lord, is, is it me? Oh, is it me? They had no idea it was Judas. They had no idea. They thought Judas was a, you know, really a, a believing part of their group and really, you know, had the right. They had, they had no idea. And then look at Ananias and Sapphira. Here they came, you know. Uh, and they said one thing and did another, but no one could see their heart. No, no one knew what they were doing except the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I'm saying is that God, when God promises someone something through his word, it's going to happen. Uh, sometimes it may be delayed. Sometimes it may not look like it's coming to pass. Or sometimes that person, uh, we don't know some things that's stopping it or blocking it or whatever. But anyway... One thing is for certain, when we walk in the ways of God, there's a reward. There's a blessing to it. Um, but when we study and apply these Proverbs, when we study and apply them, I can't emphasize more the applying part. You can study all you want to. You can study all you want to and know all about it. You can know everything, in not only in Proverbs, but throughout the whole Bible. You can be a Bible scholar and a Bible theologian. But if you don't apply that to your own life, you're just a walking, academic, you know, person of Bible knowledge. That's all. Uh, but if we study and apply these Proverbs and this wisdom, uh, we, it brings it to the point where we contemplate the mind of God 
We're contemplating how he thinks and how he reasons. Uh, we're contemplating his character here, you know, his attributes, his works, and his blessings. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge expressed in Proverbs, all of these that are expressed here in Proverbs as we contemplate them, are hidden in Christ. And that's spoken of in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge expressed in Proverbs are hidden in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 3. How wonderful. How wonderful. And we, as New Testament Christians, we have the mind of Christ. We've been born again. We are part of his body. He's the head of the body, and we have the mind of Christ. Amazing. We have access to this wisdom 24-7 by the renewing, generating power of salvation in the blood of Jesus and his death on the cross and resurrection, and by the inherent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. The Holy Spirit, the, the counselor, the spirit of wisdom and understanding dwells in us. We have access to that wisdom just like Solomon did, even, even greater. And we can apply those principles to our lives on a daily basis. Help us make choices, not only from the written word of God, but from the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and teaches us, uh, you know, the, the character and the precepts of God and how God would have us to make choices. We have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. All that wisdom is hidden in Christ. So we see uh, that um, Proverbs is an absolutely, you know, divinely inspired book, an excellent source of wisdom and on so many subjects, on so many levels. And the whole basis for it is the fear of the Lord and knowing and walking in that fear of the Lord. Someone has, you know, rightly said the fear of the Lord, of course, is the beginning of wisdom, as verse 7 says in Proverbs chapter 1. But in Proverbs chapter 8, I want us to look there where it's speaking of the fear of the Lord here. Um, I want to read in verse 13. I want you to note Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. And I love, I, I love all of Proverbs. I mean, there's not a book in the Bible I don't like. I mean, it's, you know, there's some that, there's some passages that um, I don't enjoy reading because it's so sad. You know, like in Ecclesiastes, seeing where the end that Solomon came to. And, um, and uh, when Israel strayed from the Lord and went far, far from him and, and worship those idols and put those despicable idols in the temple of God eventually. And and the part about the crucifixion when the Lord is crucified and tortured and, oh, I just, you know, it's heartbreaking, you know, to read something. But but I love the word of God, every part. And Proverbs is so good, but this this uh, eighth and ninth chapter of Proverbs here, uh, where the the climax of personifying wisdom is just absolutely amazing, just amazing. But anyway, verse 13 here of chapter 8, before I forget what I'm doing and saying, uh, it, it, it identifies for us, uh, Not this isn't the whole definition or, or identification of the fear of the Lord, but it's a part of it. It's a great part of it. And we see it here in verse 13. The fear of the Lord, here, here's what it is, is to hate evil. To hate evil, to hate pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. So we see that the fear of the Lord is to hate these things that are evil. Pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverse mouth. Oh my goodness. In this day and age, I cannot... Um, I don't even know how much um, perverse talk 
is going on all around us. I mean, it, it's, it so permeates our society and our media. Perverse, foul, disrespectful, dishonorable, in the gutter talk, music and media and programs, movies. Stay away from perverse stuff. Stay away from it. The Lord says, I hate this. I hate that kind of stuff. I hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth do I hate. So when we fear the Lord, we stay away from that kind of stuff. We we can't stand it. We were like, uh, no, I, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to be a partaker with that. I don't want my children to hear that kind of stuff and watch that kind of stuff. I, I don't want them to be a part of that kind of stuff. I don't want them to listen to that. And I don't want to listen to it because the Lord hates it and I hate what he hates. Uh, one thing about when you know the Lord and you're really his and you're really in covenant with him, you hate what he hates and you love what he loves. And he loves righteousness and he hates evil. And, it, and uh, so in this perverse day and age, be cautious and train and teach those under you to be cautious and to know the difference between uh, good and evil, to know the difference between darkness and light, to know the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness, to know the difference between the fear of the Lord and to walk any way you want to walk and say you're a Christian. You know, the Bible's clear that that's, we, we don't, we don't make the rules. God made them. And we're to live by them and it'll bring us life and health and peace and joy and so much more. Oh, so many people don't know what they're missing. They think they're having a fine time, a great time. They think this is okay and that's okay. And they do whatever's right in their own eyes. And they have no idea that it's the ways of death. And Proverbs states that several times. When you take this road, it's the way of death. You know, and as Proverbs says, uh, uh, you know, a man... Is right in his own eyes. All of us, we can judge ourselves and say, oh, this is okay. I, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong here. It seems okay to me, you know. But it could be the ways of death because we're not judging it in line with the word of God and with the fear of the Lord. And so many are doing that today, especially in the church. It's just, it's unbelievable. And it, it uh, grieves my heart. And I know it does many others. Um, okay. the So many great scriptures in here. So many great sermons. Again, there's a sermon, you know, in all, you know, almost every verse here. And uh, all the different topics. Uh, one of the things that we encourage our students to do always, and some of you who've been under our teaching before, uh, we have encouraged them and asked them to read a chapter of Proverbs every day of the month. And, um, you know, some months only have 30 days, and of course there's 31 pro chapters of Proverbs. So on, on those months that only have 30 days, or like February with 29, uh, you may have some extra catching up to do, or you may just read through 29 that month and start over again in March. But if we read a chapter of Proverbs every day, we can read Proverbs through basically every month. And you, what a eye-opener that is. What a blessing that is. Because uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't take long to read a chapter in Proverbs, even with your, all your, your other reading and studying going on. You can even listen to it. You can listen to it on your, from your phone, you know, if you have the Bible app on there. Uh, you can just listen to it as you're driving or getting ready or whatever. You don't have to sit down and read it. But you can listen or read. Uh, and how, the wisdom that's gained from just listening and listen in different translations. Don't always listen in the same one. L listen one month in, uh, you know, King James or New King James or NIV. Listen another time in the NLT. Listen another time in the Amplified. Listen another time in the message. Uh, get a different perspective and a different way of saying it. It brings out uh, truths to us. It brings it out in a way, oh, wow, 
I, I, I didn't see it in that light. Um, oh, Lord, I need to make an adjustment here. I, I, I want to walk in wisdom. I want to walk in the fear of the Lord. Uh, I don't want to hold back in those ways. And, and so um, it can be a blessing to such a blessing, such a blessing in our lives to have that foundation of wisdom constantly before our eyes. Uh, and I, I, and I'm sure you have too, seen so many times through the years. And it's been true of me. It's not, it's not just other people I've seen. It's been true of me, but I've seen it in the lives of others as well. Good, sincere, well-meaning Christians who are constantly defeated just because of a lack of wisdom in their life. Just because of a lack of wisdom and understanding not having discernment or discretion, not really, you know, seeking and going after wisdom and walking it out and applying it in their life. I mean, all the time. And many times the Lord's reputation is at stake because we as Christians, we may be good hearted, uh, but what kind of a, you know, what kind of representation are we of the Lord who is wisdom itself and who is not in bondage in any way, who's not in defeat in any way, who is the source of everything, who is the deliverer, the creator, the life giver. I mean, he's it. The Almighty, El Shaddai. And how are we representing him? And many times it's because of just a, 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 such a lack of wisdom in our lives. And making foolish choices. Foolish, foolish choices. Uh, that bring lack and disrespect and, um, uh, you know, reversals in our lives. And we're like, oh, well, you know, God's keeping me humble. Maybe it's not God keeping you humble. Maybe it's the choices you're making that are not based on wisdom. And the wisdom that's found in the Word of God and listening to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit based on that Word. Okay, well, uh, Proverbs is an excellent book to study, of course. And the wisdom there is uh, just amazing. And should be passed on. Pass it on to your young people. Pass it on to your those you minister to. Teach them the the um, uh, you know the uh, wealth and value of proverbs. The practical stuff that's there and how it is it should be applied to our life, just like it says, just like it is. And to go by those those guidelines of wisdom and discretion and understanding and integrity okay well that's all and I will be sending you the questions and answers for you to continue the study and there will be many things on there that we didn't even cover uh, in the lecture that will be uh, your study and, and continuing to find out some great truths from the book of Proverbs so God bless you and uh, we have one more week left of uh, lesson and then the final praise the Lord